15 years ago, an extraordinary flashpoint conversation about race got a lot of people talking and thinking. How much has changed in the way we deal with questions of race in our work lives and our personal lives? We'll talk about it. Today is Sunday, April 21st, 2019, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. Last Sunday, I mentioned that we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of this program. Yes, this was a very busy week of news, again, both nationally and locally. But as I promised last week, we want to look back today at an important conversation that helped forge the backbone of what we've always wanted Flashpoint to be, honest, thoughtful, and provocative. It was 15 years ago that after quite a bit of lobbying by me, the Detroit Regional Chamber allowed me to put together an in-depth conversation on something that I felt had long been neglected at the Mackinac Policy Conference. For the nation's most segregated metropolitan area, it seemed to me that the topic of race was strangely off the menu, and not just at Mackinac. Well, what followed was what many felt was groundbreaking, a very candid, occasionally charged, and always fascinating give and take among a group of people to whom I'm still so grateful, especially my friend and former colleague, Emory King. But as we prepared to head to the island for this year's conference, we wondered if it was time to take stock of what was said and what, if anything, has changed. 15 years ago, that's a long time. In 2004, Barack Obama was the state senator from Illinois, not exactly on track to be the nation's first African-American president. So this morning, how far have we come? It's today on Flashpoint. start this morning by taking you back to our primetime program from 15 years ago, which combined a conversation on Mackinac Island at the Grand Hotel with a conversation that occurred at a dinner at the home of John Ricolta. In fact, I was hoping John could join us, but he's undergoing vetting for his appointment as the ambassador to the United Arab Emirates, and he's not allowed to do any kind of media right now. But let's start with a portion of that dinner. Perhaps you saw this clip last week in which Emory King quite candidly expressed his frustration with the way race has been discussed for so long in America. There comes a point, I think, and, and I'm speaking from the perspective of a 56-year-old man. There, there, there comes a point in, for me, and I'm speaking for myself, where I get tired and impatient with having to explain certain things to white people. Right. So, yeah. so if you and, and I say this with all due respect to, 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 to you, to you, Devin, as a colleague and as a friend, actually, and to anyone else, uh, it, because I don't. I at this, this is 2004, mm -hmm. and I don't have the time, nor the desire, nor the inclination to explain certain things or to justify or defend why there needs to be an apology by the United States government, why the question of reparations is a legitimate question in this country, and 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 and. To to understand someone who says, with all due respect to you, John, I've never had an opportunity to talk to black people about some of these things. I, I, and so, and so, at that, and, I, and I can only think that I probably speak for a lot of black people in this country and who probably have similar feelings. And so, so when you say, well, I'm worried about the political correctness, I'm afraid that if I bring this up, I'm going to offend somebody and everything, I can't help you with that. The, re the reality is what it is. Right. In yeah, this country. But, but on the other it's hand, there. okay. But on the other hand of the equation, the reality is what it is in the white community, and nothing's happened for thirty years. Not my problem. It is your problem. No, no, it is not I'm my sorry. problem. Sorry. So <laughs> we don't. <laughs> Important to point out the. <laughs> Everybody thought Emory was really, really under control. Yeah. Yeah. Important to point out, though, the, the post-dinner growth that has occurred, because you have come to realize it is your problem. It, exactly. Yeah. It is my problem. I mean, I, I, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> clearly, you people are my problem. <laughs> It was quite in the evening. I was hoping Emory uh, would also be able to join us this morning. Unfortunately, uh, the schedule just doesn't uh, quite allow it. Let's bring in a group of people who were there uh, to talk about how far we have or haven't come. Hester Wheeler was a guest at the dinner table, then with the NAACP, now the Assistant Secretary of State for the state of Michigan. Rochelle Riley, uh, great to see you again, Hester. Rochelle Riley, the editor of a new book called The Burden, which is a collection of essays on the lasting impact of slavery. Uh, she was part of the panel that day. Sheila Cox 
Cockrell was a member of the Detroit City Council mm -hmm. at that time and now taking part in recent panel discussions on race. And Mary Kramer, the group publisher for Cranes, was there too and wrote rather glowingly the next day about what she had seen take place in that conversation. Thank you all very much. And we haven't aged a day <laughs> since then, which is very nice. Mary, I want to start with you. And if you could summarize, because I know you and I both went back and looked at looked your at why, why would, what was it that was so different about that conversation? Because everybody had been going to Mackinac for how many years? <laughs> and had that ever been discussed? Had there ever been a session on race? And also the candor that, that was, you know, the, the, both the video that you had from the, the dinner at John Ricolta's house and the onstage conversation, it was the first time a lot of people had ever heard anybody talk mm. about race publicly. Mm. And these were, you know, this was a business and policy conference. We look at Detroit, we look at 1967 on and every, all the entire history be, before yeah. that. It was amazing that this, that's why it was so important and so crazy that it was the first time. But it was. It, 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 it is odd that it would be. Why should that be groundbreaking? And yet it was, Rochelle. But one of the things that we somehow managed to do both at the dinner and I think, it, oddly enough, in the theater that day was created a space where people felt like they could say what was on their mind. And that's not always easy to do, I guess. It, it's simple but not easy. I think the problem is we just don't do it. Mm -hmm. We have been talking around race instead of talking to each other about the racial strife that we continue to suffer in this country because it makes people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And people who don't want to be uncomfortable don't have to do it. But unfortunately, African Americans have to live with this discomfort all the time, which means why not? It's past time. I, I think Emory was right. It's not my problem, it's our problem. So you can't look at somebody else and say, you have to fix this, or you have to fix this, we have to fix this. Well, when he said, you know, it is my problem, I guess, Hester, what he was kind of coming to realize is that you do have to find a way to engage white people to talk about yeah. race. Otherwise, it's a monologue and no dialogue is happening. And what I think he was really saying is, as an African American, I don't feel obligated to explain every racial experience that <laughs> white folk might be curious about. can't be the about. spokesperson no, for No, white, white folk are never <laughs> called upon to speak on behalf of white people, but right. African Americans very often are expected to explain that. Or if there's an issue with a black person, they'll go to the black person and say, well, what do you think about that? But they, whites are never held to that standard. And I, I, I guess what I'm also certainly saying... certainly true when we talk about the black vote, that's a, yeah. as if it's oh. monolithic, yeah, right? As, yeah. as, as if there's something real special about uh, uh, the obligation of the black vote to deliver for a particular yeah. party. Yeah. Uh, but I think if race uh, rec reconciliation or regional cooperation, if it were a priority, we wouldn't talk about it once every 15 years. I think it would be it would be right central to everything we care about. You know, a lot of the policy, a lot of the impacts. You think about. 2004, 15 years or so ago, look at all the things. I, I saw the reference to Mr. Obama having become president. Mm -hmm. The bottom fell out of the mortgage yep. industry. Uh, we, we were coming out of the takeover of our schools. So if you measure, uh, NACP has these five game changers, education, economics, uh, uh, health and wellness, young people, and and and, uh, and, and the Urban League has a, an equity index where they measure mm -hmm. pretty much mm -hmm. the same four or five things. If you measure, we've not made the progress. You, and, there's still a lot of pain, uh, but the, the thing that's hopeful is that there's so many people fighting to get it right. Well, I guess we've got work to do. Yeah, if there's a, part, a point of despair in it, I, I think I, I wondered how this would age when I went back and looked at it, Sheila. And, and I think the hope was that, as Mary said, that maybe we were kind of spurring conversation. I'm not sure there's been... Uh, it didn't exactly just bloom everywhere that we started talking, having these honest, open conversations about Absolutely. race. Absolutely. I mean, it's actually barely beginning. Uh, I mean, I think one of the re reasons is because you have to tie a conversation about race to the issue of equity and to the issue of, pat in our region, the pattern of residential uh, segregation that has shaped and formed. It's in Absolutely. the DNA of the region. And I think yeah. until we're ready to really address that, uh, phenomena. What does it mean? It means that you can have a school in Birmingham where they just built staircases and a fireplace, and you have schools in Detroit where you have mold growing out and mushrooms growing out of the out of the floorboards. Yeah. And somehow it never gets us to a point of a conversation. On the other hand, I will say, I do see. Uh, Fifteen years ago, if you were talking about white privilege, people thought you were like you know, this was some foreign language. Yes. People, white people, are beginning 
more, more white people, and I'm driven, I think, a lot by younger white people, are willing to look at this concept of white privilege, not as just, it's not a personal privilege, it's a structural, institutional yes. privilege. That's where the conversation, I think, has to, has to, has to carry forward. Good for you. Far more in the lexicon now as a phrase. Oh, yes. no Absolutely. Doubt. One of the things I think that made that a really successful time, Mary, though, was John Ricolta's willingness to say, look, I, I don't know what the Middle Passage is or meant, was yeah. and yeah. to be honest and I think that what a lot of uh, especially white business leaders or mm -hmm. civic leaders see is that it's a really good place to, thing to stay away from it's mm -hmm. like a third rail that you just don't want to touch because we've seen too many examples of people who said the wrong thing right. and paid for it with their careers perhaps. especially with social media I mean you can oh, be sure. crucified that, that, now. And that wasn't even <laughs> and, that and people years ago. say things and they, it, so that's why I think those dinners were so important because they were safe they were in a private home. Mm -hmm. It was an opportunity for people to learn from one another. People learn through storytelling, mm -hmm. I think. And so I think that those dinners were very powerful because you learned. I, I knew, a, I went to a, a couple of the dinners mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I learned things about people I'd known for 15 years. And I had no idea, no idea yeah. about some of their experiences. So that, that was very powerful. But that's one dinner. You know, so what, what happens after and that? One of the benefits, though, John Ricolta uh, is more uh, transformational because he sustained uh, that dinner experience. Mm -hmm. This I was think, through New Detroit, by yeah, the way. Yeah, through New Detroit, uh, for, Shirley yes. Stankowder. They did a lot of good things. Right. And, and a part of the reason New Detroit and folk like that can be transformational is because they, they manage a sustained conversation around race and reconciliation. Um, we can have one isolated conversation here and there, and that might be transactional. Nothing's going to change. Right. And until we as a region get to that place where we're having regular commitments yeah. to transformation. One of the things, Rochelle, that I remember learning just specifically from that week, because uh, it was really over the course of a week, all of the things that we taped, was we have to give each other some amnesty to say things yeah. that might not be the most politically correct. we got to create a space to not beat you up forever with something that you say in that course of that conversation. Well, the great shame of it is those conversations do happen. My white friends and I have conversations all the time about things that, you know, everything from hair to food to, you know, culture and history. What we don't do is try to work to get to know each other outside those spaces. So there aren't enough of those conversations going on. I don't think it's so much that you've got to have um, a, a professionally sanctioned dinner or professionally <laughs> sanctioned conversation. Right. I think we need to decide individually. Everybody says, okay, what's the next step? What do you want us to do? And I always ask them, what do you want to do? Because it's about each person yeah. deciding that yeah. I'm going to change who I am so that we can get to know each other better. We'll continue with how far have we gotten. In fact, when we come back, Hester Wheeler uh -oh. was rather prescient almost in the way he talked about something 15 years ago. This is Flashpoint on Local 4.